All right, hello everyone. Welcome to Yeast Basics 2, lecture one, the first one. This is module one where we're talking about yeast aeration or wort aeration. So every single one of these lectures, we are going to have a problem to solve. Now, the problem for today is that many brewers have fermentation issues and they have no idea why they are occurring. This is usually how an email to me starts. No issue with it, that's why we're here. In our experience, these are usually due, no, I'd say probably over half the time, due to a lack of wort aeration. Now, lack of aeration, this is the problem, manifests itself in many different ways. So today, we are going to explain why yeast cells need aeration and then how a lack of, lack of oxygen or lack, lack of wort aeration can be diagnosed. Now, if you don't want to go through this, you want the quick TLDR, too long, didn't read a version of today's lecture, here it is. Oxygen is incredibly important for cell health and flavor development, and you should always add it. Always. Now, I don't care if you're using dry yeast, you're using liquid yeast, you've wild captured stuff, if you're trying to make trying to make beers, the, will, the yeast cells will appreciate oxygen. You should always aerate your wort. Too much oxygen is always better than not enough oxygen. And in practic practically speaking, it is nearly impossible for an average brewery to have too much oxygen. We, I've only seen one client have too much oxygen. Now, the last part of this is that air injection systems require maintenance, and if you, if you see an issue suddenly appear or you know everything's going fine, then all of a sudden something changes, it's probably your O2 system. It's probably something that's mechanically changed. We will talk about that much more next lecture. Now, the quick lecture breakdown for today is we will, we will be breaking down three different areas where oxygen plays an impact. And we will be con comparing and contrasting the aerobic versus the anaerobic conditions or the oxygen present or oxygen absence present, sorry, oxygen absence uh, of each. So we're going to first look at energy produced. We're then going to go into membrane fluidity, focusing mainly on sterols and fatty acids. And then finally, we're going to round the whole thing out by looking at some toxic substances and how yeast cells break them down with oxygen or with the byproducts of ox oxygen. We will then go through a few examples and show how these things manifest in a fermentation. Now, a quick disclaimer, we always have disclaimers on this. The goal of this series is to educate and advise you on the application of yeast in the brewery to avoid common yeast problems. I'm going to be breaking these things down in as simple as I can. No simpler than they need to be, no more complex than they need to be. This will mean that I will often simplify concepts or glance over some details in an, in an effort to reinforce the point. If you want us to go in more detail, please leave a, leave a note in the comment section down below. We can bring those up during the Q&As. So, the first question for all of this to ask is, why should I care about aeration? Now, at a minimum, war aeration provides one large, huge, glaring advantage for the yeast cell, and that is it provides so much energy for the yeast cell. This big burst of energy that occurs right at the beginning of, of fermentation allows the yeast cell and it primes them, them to have to be able to degrade toxic substances in their environment. It gives them a ton of energy to repair themselves. It gives them the resources to kind of reinforce themselves and make sure that they're primed for that next fermentation. It allows them to healthily launch themselves into the thing that we want them to do. If there is one thing I could get you to take away from today's talk, it would be this. War aeration invigorates the yeast cells, allowing them to more easily and healthily complete fermentation. That is the Coles notes, that is the simplest version of what we're talking about today. Ye yeast cells plus oxygen equals more energy and a greater ability to adapt to stressors that we place on them due to fermentation. We need to provide these yeast cells, our number one employee, with oxygen if we want them to do their job well. But we can get better than that. We can look at this a bit more, you know, a bit more detailed. How much better is aerobic respiration, you may ask? Well, I'm glad you asked, or at least I was asking this. Now, if we look at aerob aerobic respiration from a yield standpoint, this is one molecule of glucose going inside the yeast cell. Um, we talked about that at length in uh, Yeast Basics 1, so if you want a refresher, go back over there and look at that. The, the, we'll, have, we'll find a link to the Yeast Basics 1 podcast in the description down below. Uh, aerobic respiration yields roughly 12 NADH. Now, if you want to follow the math on this, there's also some FADH2 and things like that in there. We're, we're assuming those are the same. Now, if we convert all this NADH into ATP, or that energy source that most, or, most single-celled organisms or, or, or multicellular organisms use, that equates to about 26 ATP. We now, additionally, 6 ATP are generated just through the standard metabolism that we see as this is being produced. And again, this is aerobic respiration. 
which yields us a net of 32 ATP if all the NADH is converted into ATP. That's great. Let's compare and contrast this to anaerobic respiration, which yields 2 ATP. That's it. It only yields 2 ATP. Aerobic respiration yields 16 times the energy of our anaerobic respiration. When we provide the yeast cells with oxygen, we give them this huge 16-fold temporarily boost of energy. And this is why it's so impactful. It allows the yeast cell to essentially uh, you know, boost itself and really prime itself, give it the energy it needs in order to do what we want it to do. So what you may be asking yourself, why is the amount of energy generated important? Well, just like a city, energy is a thing that powers everything. Without energy, if we're looking at a city here, everything stops. Systems shut down. Your Wi-Fi goes out. Accidents happen. Things become less efficient. And in worst case for a city, people die. The same thing here goes for yeast. Now, much like a city that uses different fuel sources, mainly electricity, gasoline, fuels of different, different sorts, if you're in the country, propane and stuff like that, cells utilize multiple energy sources. Cells primarily use ATP, however, NADH is used for many intercellular reactions, and you're going to see the two throughout many of the, metab uh, many of the metabolism uh, biochemistry pathways we'll be looking at in a few slides. If we run out of either, we begin to start having some serious problems. So to emphasize this point, we're going to look at some, base, some, um, some biochemistry that we looked at last uh, series in Yeast Basics 1. So what we see here is the classic, the, the classic sta stages of fermentation. So we have glucose in the top left, which then yields two molecules of ATP. Those, that, those are the two molecules of ATP that are generated from our, uh, our anaerobic respiration. That's it. You'll also notice from glucose to pyruvate, we generate some NADH. This is great. This is what we want. These two molecules of pyruvate then get turned into acetaldehyde, releasing some CO2. That's where the, a lot of the CO2 comes from that we see bubble up through our fermentations. This acetaldehyde, however, is a toxic substance. This is not a substance that yeast cells want to be present, nor do we want to be present. And the yeast cell is willing to expend this energy it has produced in NADH to break it down from acetaldehyde into alcohol. The yeast cell wants to spend this energy to break down this toxic substance in the environment to make the environment more hospitable. And it's willing to spend its hard-earned NADH in order to do it. This ends up yielding a net neutral NADH load. We produce two NADH to make, when we make pyruvate, yield ATP. And then we break these two down from NADH into NAD+, as we break down acetaldehyde into ethanol. This is why this process of strict just anaerobic respiration does not yield NADH, not in a meaningful way at least. So what's going to happen if we are find ourselves in a situation where we stress the yeast cells out, we've done some bad things to these cells, and we are limited, limited in NADH, the yeast cells lacking NADH? Well, we can look at it. If we don't have NADH, we're not going to see this, uh, this conversion of acetaldehyde into ethanol. It's not going to happen. And the environment due to this has become much more toxic because acetaldehyde does break down the yeast cells, uh, cell membranes. So through this, we're going to still going to generate the ATP. We still need to generate some sort of energy, but we're now going to start, be, start producing acetaldehyde in the environment, which is, well, not good for the yeast cells and not good for us. Additionally, our ethanol concentration is going to go down because we're not producing as much. This isn't good overall. This is not a thing we want at all. That's not the only place we see it. These are, these are not, we're going to show you two examples. These are not the only two. What we see here is the production of valine, isoleucine, several core amino acids required for operation. But more importantly, we have on the left here, diacetyl. So we're going to focus in on that a little bit. Now diacetyl, you'll notice, in order to be broken down into acetoin and then finally 2,3-butanediol, requires the consumption of NADH. So, you know, from diacetyl we, to acetone, we produce, we so you use one molecule of NADH, and then again to round the whole thing out into 2,3-butanediol, we use another molecule of NADH. If the yeast cell is limiting NADH, we're going to have a diacetyl beer. This is often why yeast cells that are under aerated or warts that are under aerated often have acetaldehyde and diacetyl problems. They don't always have them at the same time due to reasons that are a bit more complex outside of this, this talk.
But this is why we start seeing you know, a lack of wort aeration manifest itself in different flavor compounds. Sometimes it's diacetyl. The yeast cells don't have the required NADH to break this down into an odorless, flavorless, and tasteless compound we see there in, in the bottom. So it just stays around. Low NADH levels due to poor aeration cause us problems. A lack of NADH will prevent the yeast cell from breaking all these different things that are, that are toxic or just not good for it down into, into effectively neutral substances. So you may be asking yourself with this, how can I add more NADH? Well, we already showed you that. It's very simple. Aerate your wort. Proper wort aeration allows the yeast cells to go through the aerobic respiration pathway and produce large amounts of NADH. With anaerobic respiration, we don't yield any additional NADH. We don't. It gets consumed as, it, as we break down acetaldehyde. With aerobic respiration or, and wort aeration, we yield a large amount of NADH, which allows the yeast cells to facilitate all these different reactions that we see here. That's what we want to, that's what we want to see happen. Now, it's not the only thing or the only reason why we want oxygen inside of our, in our wort. Uh, sterols, just like the cholesterol, 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 in our blood plays an important role for yeast and human cells. And it, and it helps, us, helps our, yeast, sorry, our cells modulate something called membrane fluidity. Now, many of you have probably heard that term before, so let's define it. Membrane fluidity is a measure of how easily, easy it is for the cell's membrane to interact with its environment. Pretty simple. Now, if the membrane is dysregulated due to a lack of sterols, either too rigid or too fluid, then it's going to require more energy in the form of any ATP and NADH to be utilized to, ma ma to manage and, and uh, regulate that membrane fluidity. Sterols play a key role, a key, completely key role in stabilizing that membrane fluidity, allowing the yeast cells to, to spend less energy to maintain themselves. It makes, their, makes maintaining themselves far more efficient. High sterols, high, lower energy expended to actually ma to maintain themselves. And if you're curious, this is what it looks like. You can see here we have these little sterols. We have the, the phospholipid membrane right here. Uh, who anyone, I think we talked about this in yeast basis one briefly. We have some random proteins insert into the cell membrane. These sterols help buffer and modulate out the entire membrane, allowing it to better adapt to, to its environment. The mechanics of that we don't we're not we will not be going into. Now, here's the catch. Sterols, even if they're present in the environment, you can have sterols outside the yeast cell. There's been, there's been some studies that have been shown that they, they are not really able to bring them up. And they're not able to bring them inside the cell in a meaningful way. Sterols are only really able to be produced in the presence of oxygen, meaning that if we do not aerate, we will not produce any sterols. Simple as that. Less sterols due to insufficient wort aeration will make it more difficult for the yeast cells to function. Low sterols result in ATP and NADH to be utilized. Depleting the reservoirs means that, means that we're not going to have the NADH uh, and ATP required to break things down like the acetaldehyde and diacetyl that we just saw. This is not good. Now, so if we, if we look at a few of the bits when it comes to sterile production, uh, what we have here is a, the concentration of sterols inside of our yeast cells as dry weight over time. So to frame this, uh, this, this graph here, uh, researchers took samples from a fermentation of the yeast cells over the course of a fermentation at, this, at the time point, dried them out, stabilized them, took their dry weight. So we're looking at snapshots during a fermentation. A few things I want to point out here. You notice at the very beginning, these little circle dots, the sterile concentration is low. We then, when, we do, when the, yeast, the wort is aerated, we see the sterile concentration spike all the way up. This is what we want. This is what we expect when we aerate our wort properly. You'll also notice that the glycogen, which is uh, an internal nutrient reserve, a carbohydrate reserve, the same thing that you, as a human, I think you're a human, have inside of your liver and many of your muscles. This energy will then be depleted rapidly as, that car as those carbohydrates are used to produce sterols, or the energy produced from that is used to produce sterols. We then see something happen. We see the glycogen concentration for, that's incredibly low, the yeast cells are now in active fermentation increases over the course of the ferment. This is normal, this is what we want. As the yeast cells consume sugars, they will build up nutrient reserves. For sterols, we see it decrease and then baseline out again. This is normal, this is what we want. What happens here is that the yeast cells are now have maximum sterile concentration. However, yeast cells, they divide. 
they split themselves out. And this division occurs under anaerobic conditions, so anaerobic respiration or fermentation, which means they're not producing sterols, which just means that the amount of sterols we have as all the yeast cells replicate once, the average sterile concentration is halved. Yeast cells often replicate twice. They have a full fourfold increase in cell density. So we, cut, we replicate once, we cut the sterile concentration in half, we replicate again, and we're back to our baseline level of sterols. This is what we expect. This is normal. Where we get into problems, however, is when we, start, is when we do not aerate our wort. And so if we don't aerate our wort, we will not see this high spike of sterile concentration that goes up, which means in this case here, we will, we will start around 40 or so milligrams per liter sorry, milligrams per keg, of sterols. But we're still going to see this halving occur. We're still going to see it get, get cut in half. So our 40 migs per cell will then turn into 20 and then 10 in a single fermentation. We can a yeast cell can rapidly lose its sterile concentration if we do not aerate. This is part of the reason why, as we'll talk about later on in the lecture, uh, a brewery can get new fresh yeast cells in that have tons of sterols in them. The first batch or two will operate completely fine, but by the third batch they start having problems. This is a great indication that what you're dealing with is a, is a poor aeration environment or something mechanically has gone wrong for wort aeration. But more on that in a bit. If you get the situation where no sterols are present, then the, then the yeast cell will be unable to reproduce. And the culture, the viability of the culture, or how, what percent of the, cult, of the yeast cells are alive, will start to rapidly decline. If you want to follow this through, improper aeration or too low aeration will, will cause low sterile content, which will then cause increased stress, which will then cause a, a less energy to be available as the yeast cell has to apply more energy to maintain its membrane, which will then result in lower NADH and ATP reserves, which will result, result in poor fermentations, additional uh, diacetyl and acetaldehyde de development. Those things will be toxic to the yeast cell, and overall we'll see a decrease in viability. This is one of the ways that low aeration can cause under attenuation. It's low aeration stresses the yeast cell out in many ways. We're not done. There's a few things to mention here. Um, oxygen is also required to produce fatty acids, or FA, which are an integral part of the cell membrane and used for many different pathways inside of, uh, inside of yeast cells and your own cells. Fatty acids have some other interesting properties as well. Uh, this is a bit more, not contested, but there needs to be more research around it, but there are some fatty acids that are believed to act like sterile reserves, kind of like the glycogen is a carbohydrate reserve. These can almost act like an oxygen reserve. When sterols are lowered, some of these fatty acids are thought to be able to convert into, uh, into sterols or, or compounds that operate like sterols. There's one other thing on this slide I wanted to show you, and it's in the bottom right. And this is the, what you see here on the right hand side is the production of fatty acid synthesis. And you'll notice that the last step here requires oxygen. If we don't have oxygen, we're not going to get fatty acids. This is only one fatty acid we see here, this is the, the metabolism for. Every single one has a step at the end, or every single one I'm aware of has a step at the end, where O2 is required. No oxygen, no fatty acids. Now finally, we have aldehydes and fusel alcohols. Now we've already mentioned how acetaldehyde is increased if we don't aerate our wort due to a lack of NADH. You're probably sick of hearing me say that. I'm going to try and say it less for the rest of this talk. Although it's a different mechanism and pathway, this can be said for the same for different aldehydes as well. All aldehydes require NADH or some sort of energy to be broken down. Now you may be thinking, where do these other aldehydes come from? Uh, some of those grassy, grainy, kind of worty characteristics that you see those are aldehydes, and they originate from the grains and hops. Now, just like acetaldehyde, a lack in ADH will result in these not being, not being broken down. Or worse, they'll be broken down into organic acids that have undesirable flavor properties, things like oniony or garlicky, um, and are often the source of kind of an off fermentation flavor due to yeast stress. And you can see it right here. Now, I know this is probably a little more complicated than it's worth. I actually contemplated not including this slide in here, but I thought it was useful. So if you want to follow us to the top, we have some, some amino acids here, these essential elements for yeast cells, uh, for, sorry, for building proteins. These will then be deaminated. The, some of the nitrogen will be removed. We then remove and strip the CO2 off of it. And we re what we're resulted with is three different aldehydes. Now every single amino acid has a pathway. These, this, this author just chose three. Every single one, every single amino acid 
has a pathway like this and has an associated aldehyde. Now, the yeast cell wants to break this aldehyde down. Again, aldehydes are toxic to the yeast cell. So what do they do? Just like acetylaldehyde, they apply NADH and break it down into a fusel or other, other compounds like this. Isoamyl alcohol, this is, this is the precursor for isoamyl acetate. Um, very useful. Now, if we are lacking NAD, NADH, which you see here in the bottom, which is what I want to highlight, these compounds will still be broken down. Again, aldehydes are toxic for the yeast cells. What does the yeast cell do? Well, it turns them into organic acids and actually generates some, some NADH from it. From a yeast cell health standpoint, this makes lots of sense. You may recall from Yeast Basics 1, yeast cells aren't here to try and serve us. They're strictly, they're strictly selfish. They don't care about us. We are simply hijacking their natural operations. They're not going to make decisions based on the flavor compounds they produce, is what I'm getting at. And that's what you see here. NED to NADH, we're yielding some energy and we're producing some terrible tasting flavor compounds. We don't want them to do this. How do we stop them from doing this? We provide them with proper NADH levels to turn them into these compounds at the top, which is what we want. So let's put it all together. We've talked about different, a lot of different elements or how, uh, how aeration impacts it. Let's kind of bring it into one cohesive bit. Unfortunately, poor aeration rates produce a, uh, a positive feedback loop of negativity, if you will. Uh, let's go through an example. Poor aeration will result in less energy being produced. We get that two ATP versus, well, 32. Kind of sucks. Poor aeration is going to result in less sterols, which means more energy is going to be required in order to maintain membrane fluidity. And remember, we have 16-fold decrease in energy to do so. So we have to spend more energy that we have far less of. This is not good. Poor aeration will also result in an increase in toxic compounds, being aldehydes and fusel alcohols to a very minimal degree diacetyl and things like that in the surroundings. This is going to damage the yeast cell. It's going to alter the membrane. It's going to do some terrible things to it. This is going to cause the going to require the yeast cell to spend additional energy to repair itself. But we're only producing two ATP. We have a 16-fold decrease in energy. I don't have the yeast cell will not have the energy to do so. So it just gets damaged. The result here is that poor health yeast will see a decrease in viability as those damage and damage and lack of repair start to build up. We'll start seeing odd flavor compounds being produced because you know we're, we're breaking down some of these aldehydes in, into organic acids. We have diacetyl and acetylaldehydes thrown up, strewn throughout our fermentation due to decrease in NADH availability, and we're more likely to see an elongated or stalled fermentation due to these yeast stressors building up in the yeast, so not being able to fin not being able to consume the last bit of sugar. This is not good. Overall, this is not good. Now we can see this kind of feedback loop that we, we occur here. A lack of O2 is going to produce less energy, and less energy is going to be there to repair and maintain the cell. We'll see less sterols, which means that the yeast cell will have to spend more energy to maintain itself, an energy it doesn't have. Yeast cells can't go into energy debt, by the way. There's no energy bank that the yeast cell can borrow money, borrow energy from. It doesn't work that way. We'll have more aldehydes, aldehydes and fusel alcohols, which means more toxicity, which means more damage. And this will all result in decreased viability. The yeast cells will begin to die as they run out of energy and succumb to the toxic environment. This is not good. So, how does a brewer see this? How, how, do you, how will this manifest to you? Um, the issue here is that it's not going to be consistent. Often, oftentimes, different cells or different environments, you'll see... The, you know, you'll see diastole creep up first, you'll see the aldehyde crop up first, or odd flavor pro profiles creep up first. It, it changes based on the yeast strain and based on the environment, the stressors that you're placing on it. One of the weird things about this, though, and this is actually, I'd argue, a positive thing, is that fresh cells have lots of these reserves. They have lots of NADH reserves, lots of ATP present inside of them. They have tons of glycogen, large sterile reserves, lots of fatty acids inside of them. This is beneficial. Because it means that they can go through a few fermentation turns. They can go through a few rounds of that, that graph before they're depleted. Fresh cells have lots of energy and, and lots of energy reserves, reserves. They can handle some stress. Fresh cells have lots of sterols. They can go through a few fermentations where they're not producing these things, and they'll be okay. They won't be happy, but they'll be okay. 
This is why we see some brewers have issues that will occur just kind of randomly, or they're not sure why it occurs, because all of a sudden their process hasn't changed, and then all of a sudden this problem will just spring up and crop up. What they've been doing this entire time is they've actually been burning through the, these oxygen reserves, or these energy reserves, as that, that occurred when the yeast cells were being manufactured. The depletion of these oxygen compounds is, is why the fermentations before were working. If you notice any of these kind of early signs that maybe something's going wrong, this is probably your wart aeration. That's, one of, that's the biggest issue. This is also, from our standpoint, why we believe we see, you know, we'll sell the same product to a few different breweries, and one brewery it works phenomenally well, and the next one it doesn't. It's likely due, due to different alterations inside their aeration process. Now, we're not done. We still have a few more things to cover on this. So what we're going to do is kind of have a few wrap-up questions. Uh, one, does oxygen increase or decrease esters in the beer? This is something that you see a lot of nomenclature, a lot of people talk about online. And the frustrating answer here is that it depends. <laughs> um, the topic of esters instead of beer is, I would argue, poorly talked about. And a lot of people just have any sort of flavor compound and call it an ester when it's not. So if we're looking at just esters on their own without having, you know, hop drive compounds and bioconversion, stuff like that, increase in aeration typically increases levels of acetyl-CoA, which, which binds to alcohols to produce esters, such as ethyl acetate. Uh, more O2 equals more acetyl-CoA, which would then equal more ethyl acetate. Simple kind of one to one to one ratio. That's one type. That's ethyl esters. There are, however, there's, and there's some research that suggests that fatty acids, the ones that we produced uh, a few slides back, especially unsaturated fatty acids, have been shown to decrease certain ester production, not ethyl esters for all strains. It's also important to note that this uh, this alteration has been difficult to reproduce and that different strains respond differently. Differently, the, the current theory for this is that certain fatty acids actually alter the regulation of certain genes associated with ester production. Um, we need way more research on this, way more research on this. If you're looking to get consistent ester profile, it's best achieved with high aeration rates, though. If you want to make things consistent, fat, trying to work with fatty acid concentrations and trying to get the flavor profile of certain organic acid products being produced due to a lack of any DH, it's not a good approach. It's not consistent. High aeration rates result in an increase in ethyl esters is a much more consistent way to test your strains out. So question two, what about sulfur compounds? <laughs> yeah, what about sulfur compounds? Um, there are two main sulfur compounds that we see in beer, and those are uh, hydrogen sulfide, or H2S, and sulfur dioxide, SO2. Uh, and they have both been shown to be reduced when we have adequate O2. This is due to two, a few different reasons. The one, first is that we see less of them being produced just due to, due to the increased energy demands, uh, sorry, in, increased energy availability. The second one is that both these compounds are, react very violently uh, so, uh, in, in the wine world and non-beer world. Oxygen is the enemy of sulfur, so if you're trying to scrub off sulfur, providing more oxygen will help break it down and flash it off. Uh, so oxygen is your friend for both of these. Increased oxygen equals less of these. It's a good thing. What about pitch rate? Question three. Uh, yeah, what about pitch rate? This is a great question. Uh, now the Coles notes here, and I want to point out we have a whole lecture coming up, a few, uh, a few lectures post to this, all on pitch rate. So hold on for that. The Coles notes here is that aeration pit and pitch rate are associated with each other. Better way to frame pitch rate is this. How much stress can my cell handle? That's a much better way to look at pitch rate opposed to just a static number. It's also why a handful of breweries will use different pitch rates and create very good beers when we, uh, side, to side by side. If a yeast cell has proper sterile concentrations, proper NADH levels, proper reserves, it's happy, it's healthy, it's well aerated, it's going to be able to handle more stress which means we'll be more able to be malleable or a bit more variable with our pitch rate. I'm going to leave it there. We're going to talk about that topic in a bit. And finally, why do different yeast cells require different amounts of oxygen? You hear that loggers require more, saisons require less. Different yeast cells just seem to require different amounts of oxygen. What's up with that? <clears throat> There's a few different reasons for this. One of the biggest ones is that different yeast cells will produce different types and different quantities of different sterols. Now, not all sterols are as efficient as each other. Certain sterols are phenomenal, things like ergosterol. Other sterols, some of the ones that we see produced in lager yeast, are not as effective or efficient as ergosterol, um, which means that in order for the yeast cell to become happy and healthy, they require more of those less efficient sterols, which requires more oxygen. 
there's more to this than that, but that's a pretty that's a pretty simple way to answer this question. Oh, and finally, different yeast cells are thought the fatty acid fraction are thought to have um, higher or lower amounts or ability to store fatty acids that will help buffer out sterols. There's a lot more research required on that one, so we're going to leave that one there. So to summarize everything we talked about, uh, we're going to be making this chart available to everyone online. Uh, all the figures today, if you want, we can we can make available. Um, but if, to kind of run down everything, if we have anaerobic environment or no O2, we're only producing two ATP, which is not good. Uh, for the energy for, to, for membrane trafficking, we're going to require more than normal. A greater ATP is going to be required. We're, we're going to have to spend more energy to maintain our membrane. Additionally, for toxic substances present, we're going to have more. We're going to have more aldehydes. We're going to have more fusels. This is going to require more ATP to be required. It's not good. Overall, net available energy is, is very low. Uh, less energy is being produced and more energy is being required. All of this is bad. If we look at the aerobic side, uh, how much energy is produced? Lots. 32 ATP per molecule glucose. That's great. That's phenomenal. That's wonderful. Energy from membrane trafficking. We have high sterile concentration. We got lots of fatty acids. This is phenomenal. The lowest amount, po the amount of energy required to maintain this is the lowest amount possible. This is good. Toxic substances present. Minimal. The yeast cell has the energy to break all those things down, which means we're not damaging ourselves. We don't have random, you know, toxic substances around that hurt us over time. They're all gone. We've broken them down. Net available energy. It's really high. This is really good. More energy is being produced, less energy is being required. This is what we want. Now, a few just kind of other examples of under aeration and how are some of the ways in which we see this occur. First one, I, walked, I uh, saw a client last week that had, had thir fermentations that were taking uh, over, I think it was over 20 days to f complete. That's a great example of beers taking too long to ferment. I actually saw a few clients that had, had that issue. This is having two beers taking too long to ferment or, or too long to clean up. This is a classic example of not having enough NADH levels in the cells. How do we fix it? Greater, greater wort aeration. Next one, uh, yeast cell viability rapidly decreasing. We had a client that was, you know, they thought, we've actually had a few clients on this. Uh, they get the, the cells in, they thought they were aerating their, cell, their tanks properly. Turns out they were getting very minimal air, wort aeration. We'll talk about the mechanics as to why that is next week. All the sterols and energy reserves for this one were rapidly burnt out. They were putting a pretty stressful, these yeast cells were through a pretty stressful fermentation. They were only getting like two gens out of it. It was not good. Issue here was a lack of aeration. And finally, not achieving desired flavors and or flavors being, off flavors being produced. This is classic. If we're not getting the proper esters we're looking for, we probably don't have the proper levels of aeration present. If we're getting weird off flavors due to acetaldehyde or diacetyl or worse as weird organic acids, this is a great example of us not having enough NADH. How do we solve it? We aerate our wort. So with all of this being said, I hope I sold you on one point today. I hope I, hope I sold you on why oxygen is important for yeast cells. It's incredibly important. The amount of, and we, we encounter this issue all the time where people say they don't aerate their wart or they don't know how to aerate their wart or they don't think they need to aerate their wart. You need to aerate your wart. So I hope I've convinced you today that wart aeration is very, very important for overall yeast cell health. Now you may be asking yourself the logical next question. How do I ensure I get proper oxygen levels? And that is what we'll be talking about next lecture. So. With that, I want to thank everyone for, for listening. To, listening. Hope you guys learned something, and we'll see you guys next time on Lecture 2 of Yeast Basics 2. Cheers.